You heard of this thing, the eight minute abs? Yeah, sure, eight minute abs. Yeah, the uh, exercise video. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, this is going to blow that right out of the water. Listen to this seven minute abs. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and ever thinking about starting that little side business? What if you could turn it into your own money-making machine? Today, we'll chat with a guy who did just that, from my wife quit her job, Steve Chu. Plus, in our headline segment, chat GPT, yeah, you know me, and how to do everything for me. Or does it? The FTC has some concerns, and maybe you should too. And in our TikTok minute, not feeling happy? We'll share a new motivational approach to perk up your day. Of course, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to a lucky listener, and if that's not enough, I'll share some absolutely shareable trivia. And now, two guys who have seatbelts on and tray tables locked, Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G! Happy morning, stackers. It is the Stacky Benjamin Show, and uh, I am Joe Saul C. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter, and... Across the card table from me, ready to bring it today. Like he showed up today and said, I am ready to bring it, America and the rest I'm of the world. a little spicy on Monday. Uh, what happened? I can't talk about it, but I'm spicy. <laughs> well, we got, a, we got a great show. Something we can talk about, Steve Chu, as Doug so eloquently just said, is here. Steve, by the way, not only built this incredible business from home with his spouse, because they wanted to build this thing together. He will tell you he did it the wrong way and he will caution you on doing it the way he did it. And he'll show us the way that maybe you should do it. So if you're thinking about bringing in a few extra dollars, Steve's here to help. So let's get to our headline. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show. Our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our headline today comes to us from CNBC. At first I read this, and I thought, eh, what's the big deal? And then I read on and I went, oh, this could potentially be a huge deal. FTC chair Lena Khan says she's on alert for abusive AI use. And I thought, oh, gee, why not automate your stuff? Like the more the way stuff that we Doug can would automate, abuse the better. AI is way different than what she's talking about. <laughs> Have you seen Ex Machina? <laughs> That's my idea of AI. Machina. Yeah, GPT, I love you. It's Machina. It is I not. I love you. No, it's Machina. It's Machina. It's, it's, it's Machina. Machina. Yeah, Machina. It's not. It's Machina. Machina. Yeah. Anywho, as I read through this, I realized, OG, there is a big issue here. And I think that as we all start automating more stuff with Chat GPT, first of all, you're using Chat GPT, right? You're using automation. In your practice? Uh, we use automation, but we're not using ChatGPT presently, no. No? There's a major issue with it. Well, the major issue is copyright. That's the major issue for creators. And I think a lot of people don't really recognize that any content generated by, by AI is not copyrightable. Did you know that? So be careful. Meaning? I mean, meaning your blog post that you put up that's written by chat GPT, somebody else can do that exact same thing. And there's no if issue. If you wrote a book, like you're hearing all these things about a book right. where chat GPT writes most of the book, can't yeah. copyright that. Yeah. Imagine all the James Patterson ghostwriters who just got laid off. I just write. Yeah, but by the same token, they shouldn't have because like if you generate content from AI, in fact, they're talking about like different rules around how you have to like segregate it out. There's a big story the other day or a couple of weeks ago about um, somebody who took like two famous artists and put them together to make a song, but neither of those people had made that song. Had, did you hear about this? I don't know. It was like The Weeknd and somebody else or something. They made a, they made them make a song AI-wise, and it was the number one song on, on Spotify and on Apple until they realized wow. it was fake and then took it down. They're determining there's still a lot to go on intellectual uh, property here, but they're determining that that's not illegal. That's not a 
copyright infringement to use somebody else's. It's weird. So there's a lot of weird stuff coming. Well, I think this gets to a deeper problem, OG. The FTC's on alert for the ways that rapidly advancing artificial intelligence could be used to violate antitrust and consumer protection laws is charged with enforcing. Chair Lena Khan wrote in the New York Times op-ed uh, last Wednesday. She also compared the current inflection point around AI to the earlier mid-2000s era in tech when companies like Facebook and Google came to forever change communications, but with substantial implications on data privacy that weren't fully realized until years later. And what she's diving into, and this is the important thing, you know, if, if I go to AI and I say, hey, make me the best asset allocation that I could have, or make me a financial plan that works wonders for me. Her question is, while you don't need to question the AI, you need to question the brains behind who created the AI. So in other words, if we get AI creating financial plans out of Northwest Mutual, and right now AI-driven stuff is the hot button, and I'm you know, talking to you and I go, hey, man, this is what AI says is the best thing. Like this has gone through hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of iterations. And look at it says that permanent life insurance is phenomenal for you. A 27 year old single person, no, no dependents, hardly any yeah. assets that this is a big thing for you. Her question is not the AI. Her question is who's programming the AI and what's behind it. And, and frankly, when I got through this, I'm like, we're not asking that question. Like nobody's asking that question right now. Uh, I disagree. Disagree. A lot of people are, have been asking that question about AI for quite some time. Uh, probably the last eight to 10 years, there's been a big push in the IT community for uh, creating. Um, um, free I'm talking about Doug, and I think you're right. I mean, I think you're absolutely right, but not enough of these regular people that just heard about chat GPT six months ago. Okay. All right who are turning in their term paper, right? They're like, oh, look at ChatGPT is creating everything for me now. I got all this stuff. I mean, all I'm seeing on TikTok is, look, AI will do everything for you. Here's how you program all your AI to do stuff. But the brains that are just coming to this discussion are not at all thinking what's behind this. Yeah, the users, the technical talent is, yeah. is wondering about it maybe. Like you're talking about Doug. Yeah, but. there's actually been uh, a big push, and I apologize. It, it was a rough weekend, but uh, there's been a big push on the behind the scenes that people haven't realized long before Chat GPT came out. About there, there are actually roles, defined roles in organizations that are trying to make AI more uh, equitable, more uh, balanced, and inclusive, so that the logic that behind the AI is not so middle-aged male oriented <laughs> just to, uh you know just to call it out so that has been an effort for a while not sure how successful it's been but it's something people behind the scenes are thinking about but now it's got a lot more exposure it, it certainly appears with the government beginning to ask that question that this has got to be based on some pushback that they're afraid oh gee that there might be you know there's always nefarious people out there trying to yeah, I mean, take our money. I don't know if it was you that told me or if it was Lissa who mentioned it, but it was the um the the woman who got the phone call. Did you did you hear about this? The woman who got the phone call about her daughter being kidnapped? Or maybe Doug, you were you saying that. that. I told you. Yeah, that, or, yeah. Yeah, a couple of different places, but um basically criminals had used a voice sample that she had on, you know, Instagram or something of her talking, turned it the into yeah. you know, a plea for help basically. And set it up, called her mom and said, we've got your daughter, set, wire this money, da, 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 da. Otherwise, we're going to, you know, harm her in some way. And it was 100% this woman's kid. Yeah. Because it was. And yeah, she was getting ready to give him money. And they tracked her down at another place. So there's wherever there's one thing, you know, there's going to be somebody who tries to figure out how to do something awful on the other side of it. But um, if you just blindly ask questions into the system, right? I mean, we, we do that with Google now, right? When you type a search into Google and you get your search list, you you look at the source to see whether or not you decide that that source is credible or not. Just just because it ranks number one in Google doesn't mean that you believe that it's the best source, right? Because you can kind of sort of game the system. But I think what you're saying, Joe, is that too many people are just going, well, the, the computer said that this is the right way to do it. So this yeah. is what I'm going to do. So, hey, let's and jump And it's like, on. well, no, this is just Google without you having input on what the source is. 
This is the same as those commercials that were out a few years ago with the guy who was in the suit and they had him meet with some people. And then they asked him how they felt about, about the, his advice. And he was a DJ. (laughs) He's like, I know nothing about finance. I know zero. And now we're doing, I feel like a lot of us are doing the same thing with the computer. You know, we're like, Oh, well, computer says it's right. So not only will we link to this, we'll also have some deep dives on questions you should ask about your financial advice and where it comes from in our newsletter, the 201 that comes out the day after every show, every Tuesday and Thursday, stackingbenjamins.com slash 201 to subscribe to our newsletter comes hot into your mailbox every Tuesday and Thursday. Time for our TikTok Minute. This is the part of the show where we shine a light on a TikTok creator doing something either amazing or maybe hashtag amazing. Doug, which one do you think we got today? I think Doug's on mute because he doesn't know how to use the microphone still. It muted me again. It, it muted me. Look at this. It, it muted yeah, me. Blaming the AI. Chat GPT muted me. The AI. As it should. Because they've heard enough of middle-aged white guys. So it's like, we heard Silenced you. Silenced you. And you're done. <laughs> no, this is this one's legit. Oh. Yeah, I'm, well, yeah. this guy, Dan Hanchell, has a great way to make sure that you kickstart your morning, kickstart your week. I thought on a Monday we would play this. This is what they call a hack, Doug. They call it a hack to do things better during your week. Like a cab driver? Yeah. All the kids call it a hack. Here we go. This is how I trick my brain into being happy. Every morning before I leave for work, I zip tie my hands and feet together in my own bathroom. This is very scary and stressful. Once I get out, my ordinary depressing life feels incredible because I'm just happy I'm not still tied up in the bathroom. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, this guy figured it out. (laughs) It's so amazing. Just zip tie yourself in your bathroom, get out of that, and the rest of your week is phenomenal. The rest of the day's easy. (laughs) Coming up next, Steve Chu is uh, the brains behind a, a brand that, man, I remember, OG, when you and I were starting, Steve already was doing amazing stuff. His brand is my wife quit her job because she decided, you know what? I want to quit my job. I don't want to do this anymore. So let's start working from home. And Steve and his spouse uh, dove into creating a business together. However, Steve realized that things weren't maybe that great. I'm sure he'll tell us that story today. He's got a brand new book about this topic, The Family First Entrepreneur, How to Achieve Financial Freedom Without Sacrificing What Matters Most. We'll ask him about his process of creating and maybe help some stackers out there do this the right way. But first, to get there, we've got a great trivia question today, I think, Doug. Sure do, Joe. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and what a wild day in history today is. Let's take you back. It's 2007. You're watching movies on your Betamax machine while playing your Apple IIe... What? That's that's 1982? All right, okay, how about this? It's 2007. You're sitting at home watching Friday night videos and devouring Pop Rocks. 1984? Seriously? That was Pop Rocks? All right, fine. Um... Okay, let's do this again. Steve, rewind it. Clean it up. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and imagine it's 2007. You're on your iPod jamming to Rihanna's hit Umbrella and scrolling YouTube when you see that 19-year-old Sean Cotter has uploaded what he said was the trailer for a new Grand Theft Auto 4. But instead, when they pressed play, got a song, which became an international phenomenon. Not the song, but the surprise playing of this song. Here's my question. What song was it? I'll be back with the answer right after I surprise Joe's mom by actually taking the garbage out. Hey there, stackers. I'm Ultimate Prankster and GTA 4 lover, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. It's true. I love Grand Theft Auto. I get to drive slightly better than Joe's mom, but the good news, she helps you remember how glad you are to be alive every time you drive to the grocery store. Well, we're all happy to be in a world where pranks happen and spread like the one that's the topic of today's trivia question. On today's date in 2007, 19-year-old Sean Cotter uploaded a video to YouTube that he said was a trailer for the much-anticipated Grand Theft Auto 4. Turns out, 
the viewer saw a video for a song, setting off a viral trend that you might have taken part in. What song was it? If you said that the answer was never going to give you up. Sorry, Joe, I had to sing. Oh, boy. By Rick Astley, you rickrolled this question, just like everyone got rickrolled way back 16 years ago. But forget rickroll. Now, let's say hello to a guy who's here to help you bankroll more money from your side gig, Steve Chu. I'm super happy he's here with me. Mom's basement by the card table. Steve Chu's here. How are you, man? I am good, Joe. Thank you so much for having me. I never realized before I read your book uh, what a like professional gambler you are. Like you are, <laughs> you're a big time gambler, man. You take all the the money from the businesses and just pile it on the. I've I've never heard of this game before, by the way. The Pi Gao table. You've never played Pi Gao poker before. No, I play, okay. it, I play almost exclusively craps when I play. I don't gamble much, but when I do, I'll play craps. Mm. Okay. So before your audience thinks that I'm an inveterate gambler, uh, <laughs> let me just explain <laughs> Pi Gal real quick. It is the slowest game in Vegas. You could play for hours and not lose any money, but you won't make that much money either. It's, I'll just explain the rules real quick, just because we're going to be talking about it. So you're dealt seven cards. You put together two poker hands. Basically, if you win both hands, you beat the dealer. If the dealer wins both hands, the dealer wins. And if you just push, meaning you win one, you lose one, no money changes hands. And that is why you can play forever. Now, what does this have to do with what we're talking about today, Joe? Well, wait a minute. Even before we get to that, because I'm yeah. a little confused. So do you got like six people sitting around and the dealer's playing one hand against all six players? Or is yes. it just you and a dealer one-on-one? No, 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 no. It's the dealer against six players if the whole table is full. Gotcha. And is there a way to make money faster? Well, okay. So I, I don't want to get into the get rich quick. There's a way to make money. Okay. So can we just tie all this to before everyone thinks I'm a gambler? <laughs> right. uh, I use this analogy in the book because playing the regular game is like your day job. You're not going to make lots of money. You'll make enough to get by, but you know, you're getting by essentially. What I didn't talk about with Pai Gao is that there's this fortune side bet, where if you get a real hand, like three of a kind, a flush, a straight or whatnot, you got to get this slot machine-like payout. So the way I describe in the book, thanks for portraying me as a gambler, by the way, <laughs> is that your day job is the regular game. And this fortune side bet is like your business that could potentially make you outsized money. So the way I always teach it is, if you want to start a business, or if you want to achieve financial freedom, just start a side hustle on the side while you're still working. Don't just quit cold turkey to start a business or whatever you want to do. But I think that makes a, a big point, though. There's a lot of people thinking that, you know, maybe I will make a lot of money not going into business for myself. Most of our stackers work for other people. And yet you look at that ladder, Steve. It's difficult to climb. It takes forever. You've worked as an engineer. There's a lot of people fighting for very few spaces. And even when you get there, the disillusionment among those people when they reach the, quote, top doesn't feel as great as they thought it would. It does, but it does feel good for a little bit. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, yeah. I will say this, and, I, I, and maybe you can just kind of describe your audience to me, Joe, but I would say most people who have a job and they're happy there, they want to achieve financial freedom or they, they might not necessarily want to spend all their time working. And that's why it's important to have that side hustle. It doesn't have to be big and you don't have to have high expectations. You just need to be able to maintain something for a long time and eventually good things will happen. This is the way that I've started all of my businesses. I don't know if you guys know my background, but I sell handkerchiefs online, which is very masculine. Joe, did you tell everyone that I sell handkerchiefs? I did in the open. I did in the open. <laughs> I told them, I'm like, he's the best hanky salesman I ever met. <laughs> Random. But, yeah. but seriously, this, this is all around. Well, let's go ahead and start there. And actually, before we do that, Steve, because I do want to hear the story. It's a great place to start. Because what we're going to talk about today is how really not to start a business in a lot of ways, the way that you did. I think you tell a very cautionary tale that I'd love you to tell that gets into some of the levers that we need to pull if we're going to do a business correctly. But you you are somebody who initially, you guys were just interested in getting married? We were interested in starting a family, actually, which marriage, of course, comes first for most people. And in our case... 
We live in the Silicon Valley. Joe, I forgot where you live. Texarkana, Arkansas is 800 yards okay. from my house. I'm in Texarkana, Texas. Barely, barely. I live in California, Silicon Valley. Pretty sure it's more expensive. Slightly, maybe slightly. <laughs> in order to get a good house in a good school district, we're talking two incomes, two good incomes. We started this because my wife went up to me and she said she wanted to quit her job. And uh, we started a handkerchief store, as I mentioned earlier. The only reason we decided to sell handkerchiefs was because when my wife and I got married, I mean, the woman is a crier. She cries all the time out of, out of happiness, not, not sadness. And uh, I love we the line, up- by the way, I love the line, Steve, in your book where you're like, I'd be balling if I were married to me too. I, <laughs> I, la- I laughed hard when I read that line. <laughs> She wanted a handkerchief, basically. We couldn't find any anywhere except for this factory in China. And then so we imported a bunch, used a handful, and then sold the rest. And that's why the idea for the handkerchiefs came, in case anyone's wondering why I decided to sell such a random product. And that business ended up taking off, replaced my wife's salary in the first year. During that time, I want to slow down on that story just a little bit, because you did look at that time for some other opportunities. Like a lot of people, if they're going to go start a business, you're like, okay, let's dig in. The first couple businesses, it it sounded like you looked at were franchises, where maybe yes. it was going to cost you a fair amount of money. Do you, do you like franchising at all? Do you recommend your listeners, if they start a, a business or your readers, that they look at franchising? I mean, the benefit of franchising is you're taking their proven formula and applying it. It just costs a lot of money. And I'll, I'll run some numbers here. So one of the franchises we were thinking about starting was a Kumans. Do, do you know what a Kumans is, Joe? I did. My kids went. Yeah. Kumans is great. And it's, yeah. it's in line with our values, right? It's a tutoring center, basically. The minimum cost to start that thing was $350,000. Just quick money. You just write a check. I mean, you got to get a loan. You got to write a check. And then there's it takes time to start up. You got to get clientele. It just sounded really risky. Contrast that to Hankies, we only spent $630 to start that thing. I was amazed. How, how did you spend so little money on starting that business? Okay, so first off, Joe, I have to just tell you that we grossly overpay for everything in the United States. Grossly. So something that we sell for like 25 bucks might cost us like 20 cents or 25 cents. So that's how you can start a business with very little money. So that first order of handkerchiefs, I want to say was 200 bucks. And uh, that was the bulk of the cost. The rest of the cost in that 630 really was a website hosting. And I think I started on Bluehost actually. It was $7 a month back then. And then I got a beater computer. And then back then when I started, which was 2007, I actually had to go out and buy a digital camera because we didn't have phones. Now I'm dating myself, Joe. Right. Uh, <laughs> Tell us what it was like in the old days, Uncle Steve. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Joe, are you older than me? I can't remember. I am 55. Okay, you're older than me. I'm 48. Okay, so why don't you tell us back in the old days? Uh, did, did we no, have phones back then? No, 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 no. <laughs> no, I want to continue the story. So you start this business with very little money. You decide not to do the franchise in the Kumon Centers and some of these other opportunities. Costs you a lot less to get started. You are more successful than you ever thought that you would have been. But your your story doesn't open. This book doesn't open with your success. This book opens, Steve, with your wife crying on the floor with all these like half-filled orders around her. Paint that scene for me and tell me how the hell did you get there? It was just my fault, really. So, you know... If you've never had a lot of money come in before, you kind of get carried away. So that first year, we did 100000 and all of a sudden, I, I started getting these crazy eyes. Every year, we'd start setting the goals higher and higher every year. So the like next year, I was like, okay, let's try to double our sales. And then the next year, let's try to double again, try to double again. And I was just going all out and driving my wife crazy. She wasn't nearly as excited as you were even then? She was not because we're... I mean, I'm Asian. I'm pretty frugal, Joe. We don't spend that much money. We started the business so we could spend more time with family. But what ended up happening is we just started trying to make as much money as possible, even though we weren't even spending like, you know, 10% of it. That's just a funny thing that happens to entrepreneurs. We kind of get carried away. And I was driving my wife so crazy and just pushing her real hard, like, you know, both of us to make more money that one day she just broke down. And she said, hey, I don't want to do this anymore. This isn't fun. We don't even spend the money. And we're actually not even spending as much time with our family because we're trying to 
make all this money. And that's what ended up happening. You would think that this huge success that you're having along the way would make you exactly the opposite. I mean, it's, it's really sad. And what's amazing to me as I was reading your story is that the thing that you would think would have been the best moment ever was the straw that broke the camel's back. You, you find out that you're going to be on the today show. <laughs> like yeah. that, if, if, if I found out that stacking Benjamins was going to be on the today show, I'd be ecstatic and you were ecstatic, but tell me, tell me that story. What happened when you went on the today show? Man, I was so thrilled when that happened. And what ended up happening is we were only on that show for 12 seconds. 12, they 12, just met 12, 12 seconds. seconds. So I, I don't even know if that qualifies for being on the show, Joe. <laughs> right. maybe, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But our sales 7 x And it wasn't just for that day because that show aired in different times and different time zones. And we were getting 7 x the sales for, I want to say, like almost two weeks. And that almost destroyed us. You ever see that? Maybe I'm dating myself again. You ever see that Pets.com commercial back in the early internet days where they're like cheering because they got their first sales and all of a sudden, it, you know, yes. they get like yes. a million sales and they're like flipping out? That oh, was us. Oh, crap. Oh, crap. Yeah. What most people don't realize, and Joe, I know you interview a lot of entrepreneurs as I do on my podcast. You never hear about this stuff. You always hear about like the the glory stories of, you know, how they grew their business to whatever. What you don't realize is that when I hit the stop button on the record, a lot of these guys that I interview who are really successful, and they are successful, they're miserable. They're stressed out. They have these goals. They don't actually see their family much. They're estranged from their wives. And that's the story that is untold that I kind of want to tell in that book as well. Well, what about this idea, though, Steve, of the hustle culture, right? We see Gary V talks about, he doesn't say you can sleep when you die, but it's kind of the same message, right? That, hey, we got to hustle. You got to put out more. You got to put out more. You got to put out more. What's the lie there? Most of us start a business just to hang out more with family or to do stuff that we want to do. You don't have to hustle your butt off if all you want to do is make a couple million bucks. Seriously. So hustle culture, I think, is way overrated because it actually takes you away from the goals that most people start their businesses in the first place. I don't want to pick on Gary V, but I know he just got a divorce recently. And I can't imagine that that hustle mentality that he's portrayed for so long was good for his family. Because realistically, you can't hustle that hard and still have the time to, or, or have the mind share, so to speak, to be with your family. You've got uh, an analogy that uh, your friend and a guy who's been on the show a couple of times, James Clear, shared with you about the four burners. And I think this is an important idea for, no matter whether you work for somebody else or for yourself, Steve, I thought this was a very powerful analogy. Can you walk us through the four burners and how you kind of work your burners? Yeah. So... The four burners theory states that your life is composed of four burners. So there's uh, health, work, family, and friends. And in order to excel at any one area of those four areas, you have to turn off one of your other burners. If you want to be really good at something, you have to turn off two burners. And if you're Elon Musk, you probably turn off three burners and your work burner is like way up high. Yeah. Basically, the theory is about trade-offs, right? So if you want to have a really strong family... Well, you're going to have to sacrifice one of the other burners. If you want your business to really take off, you're going to have to turn something off. There's always some sort of sacrifice. And the sooner you realize that, that you can't have it all, is when you can actually make some fundamental decisions on what your priorities are in life. Most people don't think about their priorities. Most people don't revisit their priorities once they start something. As, as I'm hearing you talk, I remember back when I was a financial planner, and I haven't been one in a long time. But when I would encounter an entrepreneur, I would ask him a very simple question, which was, is your business working for you or are you working for your business? And that very simple question, Steve, to your point, 99.9% .9 of the people I met were like, nope, I am now working for my business. My business has taken off and I'm just kind of trying to take the tiger by the tail and I can't, I can't do anything with it. Like, like I, how do I get out of this mess that I created for myself? So you take a completely different approach. And your your approach, it sounds like, starts off partly with outsourcing. When I say outsourcing, I'm always very careful with that term. I prefer to outsource to robots and computers okay. as opposed to humans. I, I actually hate when I go to an event of entrepreneurs and the first thing that I get asked is, how big is your team? 
because I don't think that the size of your team is reflective of how successful you are. Like my wife, quitterjob.com makes a million dollars in profit. I literally have one VA in the Philippines. It's about putting together systems and automation if you can. We just happen to be living in the era of artificial intelligence, which is going to make things a hell of a lot easier. It's about automation, documenting stuff, and there's a bunch of principles. I don't know how in-depth you want to go into this. Yeah, just slightly to give people an idea about how different you run your day versus this hustle culture that we were just talking about. Let me just give you an example that I think everyone can understand very clearly. I'm actually not heavy on social media. My friends who do social media well, like I have a friend who does Instagram, she posts seven times a day. I have a friend who does really well on Facebook. She posts 21 times a day. And guess what? When they stop posting, the traffic stops. So the reason why I don't focus on social media is because I feel like it's a hamster wheel. Instead, what I do is I focus my time on things where I can just do once and it has lasting value. So for example, search engine optimization. Once you start ranking in Google, you get traffic for a long time. I have articles that I wrote 10 years ago that still generate me traffic. On YouTube, I have videos that I produced three years ago, still get a ton of views and leads. So it's all about prioritizing your activities so that you get the biggest bang for the buck. So that's one example. An example, another example that I like, by the way, is the way that you focus on the burners. I want to go back briefly to the burner because you also spend a lot of time, and this is something that a lot of entrepreneurs like, oh, you spend a lot of time on your health. Talk about that. Health is such a huge thing because before I was paying attention to health, I would have lunch and then I'd be done for the rest of the day. I'd have no energy to do anything. And when you focus on your health, all your other burners actually get stronger because you have the energy to follow through. I started this health journey in 2014. Actually, I was going for the six pack at the time. I just wanted that once in my life. (laughs) That's a different story. I feel like I'm going for the protective (laughs) coating over the six pack. That's what I'm going for. (laughs) I ended up losing uh, 35 pounds, I think in two months. Wow. By cutting out carbs. And I just found that I had so much energy. My brain was never in a fog. And I could actually work continuously in a stretch without getting tired. And that just boosted my productivity all around. How do you keep the family burner on and juggle the career? Yeah, I, I, honestly, the career part, like it, it's all about ego, really, and controlling the ego. Because the problem is, is I'm in these mastermind groups with very successful people such as yourself, Joe. And everyone's telling me how much money they're making, millions of dollars here. I belong to this group at Stanford. It's called the Mayfield Fellows Group, and Kevin Systrom is in that group. Every year we have this retreat, everyone's starting these multi-million dollar companies and telling me about their exits, and I go up and I say, hey, I, yeah, I'm, I'm still selling handkerchiefs, right? So I have this ego issue, and the way I fight it is every single year I just work on one thing, and I just focus on it, and whatever happens, happens. So this year it's launching my book. Last year it was YouTube and I managed to hit 200K subscribers. The year before that it was TikTok. The year before that it was ads. So I just pick one thing and as long as I'm interested, I'm okay on the ego front. Now to prevent yourself from getting carried away, I must say that my wife contributed a lot to that, especially when she broke down. But today we actually have this document where, you know, if there's an opportunity that comes, let's say, let's say um, I had to fly somewhere to Asia for some amazing opportunity. Well, we now kind of quantify that opportunity. And if I'm going to miss any of my family's activities, we just have a discussion on what's that going to actually do and whether and how that compares and whether it's worth it really. And I would say in a lot of cases, it's not worth it, especially since we don't spend that much money. So, I mean, ideally, and I don't know how many of you guys have read Profit First, you find out how much you spend in a year, you pay yourself that money, everything else is gravy. And that really helps the mentality. That's so funny. I was just about to ask you about Profit First because it sounded like you were singing off the Profit First song sheet right there. (laughs) You quote Gary Keller in your book, of course, the real estate uh, billionaire. You write, when you know what matters most, everything makes sense. When you don't know what matters most, anything makes sense. What does that mean? That means you got to have your priorities straight because if you're just always off fighting fires and stuff, you're always going to get overwhelmed. I think it also means to me, as you're saying that, it means you're going to go to these mastermind sessions. You're going to hear the badass stuff that everybody else is doing, Steve, and you're going to start 
biting off all these other things and the family burner turns off almost automatically. It does. It, it has that effect. I, you know, th- I'm not going to say this is, this happened overnight, Joe. I learned all this stuff just through hardship, really, and, and driving my wife crazy. She's a very patient woman. I mean, I, she caught me on the Dumbo ride once sending out an email blast. Like she literally <laughs> snapped a photo. Like just because you're present with your kids doesn't mean you're actually present, right? You yeah. want to be mentally present yeah. with your kids and your family. You could have easily done that on the, uh, what's the one next? The teacups. The teacups are kind of boring. The Dumbo ride's <laughs> the badass. Why would you do that on the Dumbo ride versus the teacup? This is the hard hitting interview right here, Steve. This is the, <laughs> for the whole book tour, this is the question that you're going to have to remember. No, I actually want to get onto something else, which is, sure. I've got an entrepreneur that's really frustrating me right now, frankly. And it's because every time he sees something to the Gary Keller point, we just talked about a second ago, he sees a sale opportunity, he chases it. And he's always chasing 8,000 different things, thinking this is the path to success. You talk about, with your wife especially, working in your zone of genius. And I get coaching from Strategic Coach, and we talk all the time about this same thing, zone of genius. I want to I talk about this because I feel like this is such a powerful concept. And once entrepreneurs realize that, I think the outsourcing comes more naturally. Your ego gets a little bit more in check. Talk about your wife and working in her zone of genius. Yeah. And I think this is something that a lot of entrepreneurs face. Like in the beginning, you're trying to do everything because you're trying to save money. You're trying to do everything. But realistically, we're not good at everything. There's certain things that we all hate doing. There's certain things that just come really quickly to us. And early on, this this happened to my wife. Like she was doing all the day-to-day, packing orders. We were all packing orders. And she was sewing and doing all this stuff. And that's not our strength. I mean, that's our, I mean, we can do it, Sure. but it's not where our time is best spent. It wasn't until we, we started outsourcing mainly the stuff that we didn't want to be doing first. Did we realize that our time was just so much more efficiently spent doing other things, higher level things like growing the business, higher level things like how to market our products or how to portray our products and that sort of thing. That did not happen until like year two or three. I want to give everybody an idea of your days as well. You write uh, for you, weekdays are your work days from nine to one. That's a nice schedule. I rarely talk to anyone during those times. Tuesday and Thursday afternoons are health days. I'll either play ultimate Frisbee, you write, or tennis or go for a run. Weekends and nights are reserved for family and friends. You got that all carved out. But you say it doesn't have to be like that. You have a friend who runs ecommercefuel.com. Andrew uh, Yuderin, is that how you Udarian, pronounce it? Yeah, yeah. Udarian. Mm-hmm. Andrew devotes an entire year to going hard and then he relaxes. Like he takes monster time offs and you say you can separate that however you want. But it seems to me, if you've got a mind of an entrepreneur, Steve, you know, you write somewhere in your book and an entrepreneur is somebody that will work 80 hours to avoid working 40 hours for somebody else. I've heard that a lot too. Like, how do you turn it off? How do you actually click that mind fence so that now I am not sending out uh, emails on the Dumbo ride. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, As I mentioned earlier, I only do one thing a year now. That's it. I don't try to do like five things all at once because when you try to do too many things, that's when you run into problems. Uh, So uh, that Udarian story that you just told was just kind of a way to cheat the burners because you can turn them on and off at any time, right? And so he chooses to go all out and then he relaxes. That's not my style. So so I run two seven-figure businesses and 20 hours a week. And the only reason I'm able to do that is because I do drop a lot of things on the floor. Like this year is the year of my book launch and everything else is kind of in coasting mode. The other things that I'm working on probably aren't going to grow really heavily because I'm focusing on the book and that's all I'm doing this year. But at the same time, you're able to keep the family burner going because of that. The family burner always goes. In fact, my whole afternoon... I'm a glorified Uber driver. That's the best way to put it. I've been there. (laughs) People always tell me, hey, Steve, why don't you just hire a driver or something, right? And I'm like, dude, this is where I get all the good stuff. Because when you're driving the car, your kids forget you're driving and they start talking about all the juicy stuff with their friends. Like boys who they like. And I'm just like, I'm just kind of like listening in. Uh Uh-oh. So I wouldn't miss being a driver for the world. I miss those days fondly, except when it was 5 a.m. Take him to swim practice. That was the one I didn't like. The 5 a.m. swim practice run was not my favorite. Yeah, that's brutal. That's brutal. There's a lot of people listening to this now. They're like, whoa, wait a minute. 
I can do this in a healthy way. I can build a business where I don't have to have the hustle culture. It is possible. What business do I start? Yeah. Let's say that I'm interested in cupcakes. We had uh, Austin Cleon on. I think, you know, Austin Cleon, uh, steal like an artist. Mm -hmm. Austin talked about cupcakes and somebody loves cupcakes and you you know, Steve, the first thing anybody says when you love cupcakes is you should start a cupcake business. Oh, and the yeah. second you start this cupcake business, you effed it all up because you just took all the joy out of the cupcake business, right? Out of making yeah. cupcakes. It's no fun anymore. It's like your wife was sewing. She's on the floor because she's way over her head and sewing and sewing and sewing. And it's so boring at that point. So how do you, how do you not get into that predicament? Where do you begin when you're choosing the right business to go into? One thing that I always consider is how I'm I going to grow this business without me being in it up front. In the cupcake business, if you're the one baking the cupcakes, that's not going to last. So the only way are we using cupcakes as an example here? Let's do it, man. Let's okay. let's lean into it. So the only way that I would personally consider doing cupcakes is if I could somehow license the recipe to someone else and take a royalty. If you guys watch Shark Tank, that's like Mr. Wonderful's like mo right there. <laughs> right, right. Or if I could contact like a co-packer to create like a mix that I would sell in stores. But I probably wouldn't go off and just try to sell already made cupcakes unless I had a plan in place. Because even if you contract the baking and all that stuff out, it's still a lot of labor and quality control, I think. Well, but let's back away from cupcakes then okay. and go back to a question of... If it's not cupcakes, then how do I explore it? You say passion is BS. Don't follow your passion. Correct. I would say you should always do something where you have knowledge. Joe, in your case, you're a master podcaster. So I would try to leverage that maybe into a service or content. I would say content is probably the most scalable type of business that you can have because it's digital. You produce it once, you can sell it as many times as you want and make the same amount of money. The only downside for content, and maybe you can share your side here, is that it takes a long time for it to get established. Like my blog, I didn't make any money until after two years. I didn't start making significant money until after three years. My YouTube channel, same thing. I didn't start making money until after two and a half or three years. It takes a while. If you want to make money sooner, then you have to actually sell something. And I personally like e-commerce. If you want to make money within a year, you get a physical good. And you can sell that and you have this supplier that's giving you a constant supply of this stuff and you find customers. In the long run, if you have the runway, like if you're willing to do this for at least three years, I think content is probably the best play. If you want to make money sooner within a year, sell something, whether it be a service or a physical product. The good news is, is you tell people, and this is another question I know you get all the time, Steve, do I quit my job right away? And your answer is, oh, hell no. The answer is to play pie gal poker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice. It's the circle of life. Don't don't quit the job. Don't it just <laughs> you know what ends up happening? You end up starting making decisions based on the money because you're in a pinch, you don't have the income anymore. And you can't really run a business that way. So keep the job, do it on the side. Everyone has time. Like I waste so much time even still, and I think I'm pretty efficient. Cut out TV or or cut out something that doesn't really directly benefit you and you'll find the time. Everybody knows that thing. Like anybody who's hanging out here with us listening, they know the thing where they're wasting time. Like it's, it's there. Your book is the family first entrepreneur, how to achieve financial freedom without sacrificing what matters most available everywhere. Mr. Chu. It's available everywhere. And, uh, I over deliver when you pre-order the book, you will get a three day workshop on how to start a print on demand business. There's a reason why I start with print on demand. If you guys don't know what print on demand is, this is where you design your stuff and you can sell merchandise where the supplier takes care of fulfillment. You don't have to touch any inventory. I consider that a gateway drug into other e-commerce businesses. You probably won't make life-changing money with it, but it'll get you started and you can start with very little money. I'm also giving out a two-day workshop on how to make money with content. I make money blogging, podcasting, and with YouTube, and you'll learn how to do that there. And I'm also doing a six-week, what I call a family first challenge, where I will walk you through in a Facebook group how to choose your next side hustle. Those are the bonuses. Awesome. And we get them. How do we get there? Immediately. So you go over to the family first entrepreneur. 
You pre-order the book, fill out a form, and then you'll get a login to a private membership site that has all the bonuses that I just described. Awesome. And you know what, Steve, if people are walking the dog or they're commuting to work while they're dreaming about being a family first entrepreneur, we'll have a link in the show notes at stackybenjamins.com. Great talking to you again, my friend. I feel like you're a guy I don't get to talk to enough and I always learn so much every time I do. And I even learn about poker. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Joe. I really appreciate it. I'm Liz, the Chief Mom Officer, and when I'm not busy being the breadwinner of my family of five, I'm stacking Benjamins. Thanks again to Steve. What a great story about doing that the right way, OG. Do you work for your business or does your business work for you? I just have a job where I have to, I have more stuff to do and I get paid less. Yeah. I created yeah. a job for myself. I didn't create a business. Steve's got a great reminder there. Make sure the business works for you. Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, Doug, they put what you value first. Maybe oh a my God. full night's sleep. Yeah, my own bed. Full night's sleep in my own bed. But your Holy loved ones cow. in your time, but how fun to be in your own bed with your loved ones on your time. It's why they made <laughs> buying quality term life insurance actually simple. You go to stackybenjamins.com slash Haven Life now for a free quote. Love what they're doing over there because... Their application is simple. It's online. You get an instant coverage decision, affordable prices, and all policies issued by their parent company, Mass Mutual, more than 160-year-old insurer. Today, we're going to throw out the lifeline to Mr. Daniel. Hey, Daniel. Hey, Joe and OG. Had a question. I recently left my employer and had a pension for which I was vested. I had about 90 k that I contributed uh, and I have the option to roll that over into my Roth IRA. Or I can keep uh, the money in the pension, and at 65, it would pay out about 30K, uh, which, for which it is inflation adjusted. Uh, I'm not sure which one to do. And I'm um, not sure why I'm asking you this, because I haven't really learned that much from your show, but I really want a free t shirt. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> he almost made it through without insulting us, but uh, th thanks, Daniel. <laughs> for the question. Oh, gee, this is a great question. A uh, fewer and fewer people have pensions, but man, for people out there that do, I got this pension. I can take it as a lump sum or I can take it later. What, do, what, what does he do? How does he think through that? I don't think his math is right. Did, did he say he gets 30,000 a year on 90,000 today? The 90,000 is only his contribution. So the company must have been putting in money as well. Yeah. So obviously there's some more money there. I missed that part. And to be clear, if he moves it into his Roth IRA, he'll have to pay taxes on that. Yeah. Right. Because that money that goes in your pension is going to be pre-tax. So you can move it into an IRA. But if you take it out and, and move it to a Roth IRA, that's going to, you know, that's going to be ordinary income that year. And um, technically, and isn't that still a two-step move? Yeah, absolutely. Move it to the IRA first. You can't go pension directly to Roth. It has to go pension, IRA, flip over to the Roth, pay the tax. Yeah. I think some of this just is dependent on how much your employer contributed and how long it is from now between, uh, or how long it is between now and, and 65. Because really what you're trying to decide is, is 30 grand in the future worth you know, this money today. And even if you're vested in your pension <clears throat> and they're offering a lump sum, the employer contribution should be available to you also to zero out. You know, that's your money that you've accumulated by, you know, if it's vested, right? That's your, that's the employer's contribution that's yours. So maybe we don't have all the data here, but really what you're trying to decide is, can I take this bucket of money and can I turn it into a higher bucket of money than they're going to turn it into? The difference between a pension and your own pot of cash is that the pension is going to be paid to you based on your uh, lifetime. And when you stop existing, then they will stop paying. So if your retirement is two months long, you're going to get two months worth of checks and nobody gets anything else. Or if you live to be 140, you'll bankrupt the pension system. <laughs> you know, they keep paying forever, right? And so that's good too, if you live on that side. So it's really the gamble of, am I going to live a long time in retirement or not? The fact that it's inflation adjusted suggests to me that it might be some sort of um, government or, or you know, teacher type pension or something like that, because you don't see a lot of inflation adjusted pensions, because that's a big deal too. Obviously, if, if it's not, getting 30 grand at 65 is a whole heck of a lot different than 30 grand at 85, 
you know, and you'd want to be able to offset that too. So I think really your calculation is what's the big bucket of money? And you might have to just call somebody and have them run this for you. How, how much can I take today? What can it grow into if I invest this on my own? And can I turn that into a higher stream of income uh, than the pension people can? Yeah. And the question is from me too, if he can only take out the part that he put in, will, will there still be some pension anyway? Right? Like, is there a middle ground? If, if the employer contribution needs to stay there, maybe he gets a smaller amount that's the guaranteed pension part and he takes his out to be more flexible. Yeah. Because there's got to be. That's another part of the question. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's got to be more money in there. Like, if he takes his out, that can't sink the entire pension. Well, that's my point. I think, I don't think that you would be able to take out part of it. That doesn't, yeah, it does. You know I, what I mean? Like you gotta, you gotta close the thing and roll it over or, or keep it intact. Never heard of that before. And if the company isn't contributing, oh gee, I'm with you. That the, the, the math is wrong. Yeah. It doesn't check. And if you did put in 90 and that's all there is, and they're going to give you 30 a year out, that's a way better deal. Yeah. Take the 30, <laughs> take the 30 a year, <laughs> just live three years, stay in a bubble for three years. And then, <laughs> and then it's gravy train from that point forward. But there's there's got to be a little bit more to that in there. Danny, why can't you come out of your house? Uh, I got I got a year and a half left on this in this uh, pension crossover. I got to make sure I make it. Thanks for the question, Daniel. If you've got a question and would like us to send you the Haven Life Greatest Money Show on Earth shirt, head to stackybenjamins.com slash voicemail. Ask OG your question and we will get that on the air. We'll answer your question. Help out a lot of stackers when you do that, by the way. So... Jump in. The water's warm. Stackingbenjamins.com slash voicemail. All right. That is just about it for today. Let's look at the community calendar. You know, I am going to be on Instagram on Thursday with a guy who is a real, really amazing dude. He weighed, OG, over 300 pounds when he decided he was going to run a marathon. And he had people, oh. he had people tell him, not, not that it might not be the world's, you know, smartest thing or healthy thing. They just told him he couldn't do it. And he said, no, I can do it. I can do it. Good for him. We're going to record live an interview on Instagram on Thursday with Martinez Evans. So if you want to hang out with us, ask Martinez, uh, he's got a huge group of people that follow him on running and how he got started and what he does. We're going to actually play that interview here on the show on uh, Memorial day. We always try to do something a little special, a little different on Memorial day. And Oh, gee, talk about goal setting, you know, goal setting and perseverance and getting it done. It's funny because people don't think that that has much to do with your financial life, has everything to do with your financial life. So happy to talk to Martinez Evans, Instagram on Thursday at uh, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. That's what's going on here this week. Coming up on Wednesday show, Aaron Lowry. The broke millennial herself is back and I'm super excited nice. that we get to talk to Aaron again on, on Wednesday. She's always so great, has fantastic advice and has helped a lot of people. So Wednesday, she's going to be helping us. But if you're not here because Aaron Lowry is going to be on, you're not here to talk about running when you weigh over 300 pounds. You're here because you keep hearing all of this mixed messages about what's going on in the economy, what's going on with the financial markets, and you might be feeling anxious to make some moves with your finances. What I'd like you to do instead is this. Check out this free guide OG and his team put together that'll help you plan more and panic less no matter what the market does. It's got some great insights on what you should be doing and smart questions to ask yourself so you make financial decisions your future self will thank you for. Head to stackingbenjamins.com slash guide. That's stackingbenjamins.com slash guide to get that free guide from OG. All right. That is our community calendar for this week. Doug, between Steve, our headline, amazing TikTok minute, lots of takeaways. But what do you think of the top three? Yeah, tons of takeaways, Joe, but here's my top three. First, take some advice from Steve Chu. Working harder isn't working smarter. Begin your plan by thinking, how can I do more inside the time box instead of expanding the time I work? And you'll be much, much happier. Second, if you find that tying yourself up makes you feel better about your day, well, then maybe listening to shows like this isn't your thing. But the big lesson... 2007 was 16 years ago?
I think Father Time just rickrolled all of us. This has got to be some kind of joke. Thanks to Steve Chu for joining us today. You'll find his book, The Family First Entrepreneur, wherever books are sold. We'll also include links in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2023, and is created by Joe Salcihat. Our producer is Karen Repine. This show was written by Lacey Langford, who's also the host of The Military Money Show, with help from me, Joe, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. Kevin Bailey helps us take a deeper dive into all the topics covered on each episode in our newsletter called The 201. You'll find the 411 on all things money at The 201. Just visit stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Tina Eichenberg makes the video version of this show. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude and Kate Yunkin are our social media coordinators, and Gertrude is the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So say hello when you see us posting online. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. Not only should you not take advice from these nerds, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show. Oh, Gene, I want to wait, Doug, because we know how much you want to hear about my trip to Spain. Oh, thank God. I didn't miss it. So so we waited for you. <laughs> oh, I thought nope. with all of that fumbling and I was late to get <laughs> sit down and record. I'm like, no, it's like, I got to get there. Please, please, please get that done before I get here. Are there pictures? Are you going to show pictures? I will, show th- pictures. Th- there will be a, f- a 75 minute slide presentation Yes, um, where we show about a quarter of the pictures or we could do the extended <laughs> version. With, with even more. Actually, I do have some pretty good pictures, but I'll just share one story. It was a road trip and I'll, I'll tell the story about getting the car because I messed that up another day. But we were, the funniest thing that happened to us, we're in Cordova, which at one time, it was the center of the Moorish Empire. It is beautiful, beautiful mosque that when the Christians retook the land in... Uh, 14, what's the year Columbus sailed the ocean blue? Cause it's the same year, 1482, 1460, something like that around there. 14, 15, uh, Doug, Doug, you're a mute. Are you serious? You're kidding. Definitely right? something in the 14s and the 1982. Twos. Yeah, that's exactly. it. Nailed yes. it. Okay. Move on with the story. Oh, this is fantastic. I'm not even going to correct you. Cause I know all of our listeners are screaming at their devices right now. And you've also lost all of your credibility. It's 14 something too. I used to say this all the time. Yeah, you you. got it. Totally nailed it. Well, 1462. (laughs) One of those. Sometime during the 14th. Uh Uh-huh. Sometime during the 15th century. 16. I think. 1642. 16. 1642. Yes. Oh my God. Right, right. Can the whole after show just be about this? being sacked. 1682 something. Anyway. 1682. As Jamestown was being sacked, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. There was, there, there, there was a, it might've been before that there was a castle that they built in Cordova. And initially it is this beautiful castle, but when the Moors left Spain, the agreement was just like when 
they had ruled that the Christians could live there and the Jews could live there. And the Christians were like, yeah, that's cool. And that lasted eight years before, before the Spanish Inquisition began. And then it was get out or we're going to make sure you convert. And if you don't convert, we're just going to kill you. So this castle went from being a castle to being a jail and torture house and a place where they would execute heretics. And it was that way for a couple hundred years. The interesting part of this story is we're hearing this horrific stuff from our guide and we pop out of the castle into this gorgeous little garden. Like there, there is this, there's this beautiful fountain that's been there apparently forever. There's orange trees full of oranges. It smells great. There's beautiful flowers. And the guy says, beautiful garden, isn't it? And we're like, oh yeah, this is amazing. He says, this is the place where the torturers and executioners took their breaks which, which all of a sudden, of course, our family, we start thinking of all of this gallows humor. Like, can you imagine these guys? Like they're going out there with their cigarettes on the smoke break. Oh, they're bitching today, Lou. Oh, my, these people. Oh, they just, they won't quit crying. It just, it gets on your nerves. I go home at night and I just think, man, but you know, it was horrible. Beautiful, beautiful class guy. act there, just Joe, just just fantastic. I thought you were going to say that's where they had all the bodies. That was the fertilizer. I didn't know. That's exactly what no. I thought too. Oh, the, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I'm seeing this. Are, are you kidding me? I didn't make up the fact that it was the break room. That this was the break garden. Like, wouldn't your your brain the wouldn't break go there? room? <laughs> it was. Do you think? Do you think they had those little packets of uh, hot chocolate in their break room? Back then, one guy hangs out there the whole time, never does any torturing. Right. Every time you walk it's in like, there, he's just sitting I, there. He's he always on break. Yeah. yeah. You're like, what the heck, man? Don't you have anybody to maim today? I just got like, it. I know. I just, the old oh. lady's been on my ass the whole week. You know how it is. It's hard to get motivated some days. Hard to get motivated. I know. It's like the Ford shop. There's just conveyor belts of. Okay. You know, you just went too far. That have to happen. <laughs> that, that, there was a line. <laughs> Just, Everybody else listening is like, dude, that line was about four minutes ago. And we're like, no, we just got jumped that. right across it. <laughs> this past weekend, we uh, power washed our deck back patio. I just had my what, voice help. What about my story made you think this reminds me of <laughs> he was torturing his kids <laughs> as I'm torturing my. No, yeah. I tortured myself. I was very particular. I was like, guys, listen, the water that comes, I get it. It's super fun. You know, you have, don't, don't spray this at one another. Don't, don't oh, spray it at something. Oh, don't, don't point oh. it at the fence. It's going to take off, you know, Skin. they'll take all the varnish off of it. It'll take, it'll take layers of wood off. And it was a big project. I think we probably, all three of us did probably about a third of it. And then one of the power washer hoses got a leak in it. So I had to go get another one, like more of a handheld one. And so I'm finishing up, I'm doing like the, the bar area and like getting all the grease off it from the barbecue and stuff. And I'm doing it and, and I, I'm holding this thing in my hand, this power washer, and I'm like, shh. And then I reach across to grab something else and power wash the right out of my arm. Took several layers of skin right off. My kids oh. are all playing in the pool. And I'm like, yeah. So, hey, guys, remember when I said not to power wash yourself? This is what I meant. And there's like oh. this big streak that goes down my arm of like, like from four inches away, I just went right across the other oh. side of my arm. I tortured myself this weekend. It was great. That's why I'd be in the break room. 